The Ginna brothers of Chicago's Little Italy neighborhood were among the worst of the city's bootleggers and gangsters. They ruled the West Side by threats, extortion, violence, and bullets, but their grip on the territory fell apart on May 26, 1925, when Angelo Genna was gunned down by rival gangsters. Angelo had long been considered the toughest and most brutal of the Genna brothers. It was Angelo who created the brothers' first black hand extortion schemes and essentially launched them into a life of crime. When he married Lucille Spinola, a member of one of the city's wealthiest and most prominent Italian families, the Guinness achieved society status in the city. The wedding turned out to be one of the largest in Chicago history. After the wedding, the newlyweds moved into the fashionable Hotel Belmont near the lake. They were hunting for houses but couldn't have been happier in a neighborhood that was then occupied by leading Chicagoans like former Mayor Thompson, who lived just across the street. Like his brother Tony, Angelo loved the opera and loved to play host to local and visiting performers, all of whom were delighted to accept his hospitality. In May 1925, Angelo and Lucille found a home in suburban Oak Park and began making preparations to move. On the morning of May 26th, Angelo set out in his Roadster Coupe to pay for the new house in cash. He drove south from Belmont Harbor on Sheridan Road and then turned southwest on Ogden Avenue, which at that time extended all the way to Lincoln Park. As he approached Hudson Avenue, a large black touring car carrying four characteristically unknown assailants, as the Chicago Tribune described them, sped up next to Guinness' car. The passengers fired a dozen shotgun blasts into Angelo Guinness' car, causing him to lose control and crash into a lamppost. The gunmen sped off, leaving Angelo to die. Genna was rushed to the hospital, and as he lay on his deathbed, Police Sergeant Roy Hessler pleaded with him to name the men who attacked him. "'You're going to die, Angelo,' he said. "'Tell us who bumped you off.' But Genna just shrugged his shoulders and closed his eyes. He died a short time later, never revealing the names of the men in the black touring car. The police suspected members of the North Side gang, including George Moran, Jaime Weiss, and Vincent Drusi, who were still seeking revenge for the murder of Dean O'Banion, which had occurred the previous fall. But as the newspaper said, you'll know who murdered Angelo when the next big guy in the neighborhood is murdered. The next big guys to be killed, though, weren't gangster rivals. They were members of the Genna family. Angelo's funeral, like his wedding, was one of the grandest in the city's history. Cardinal Mundelein refused to allow him a church funeral and so he was buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery in unconsecrated ground, just steps away from the resting place of Dean O'Banion. Thousands of dollars were spent on flowers, and Al Capone sent an eight-foot-tall arrangement of lilies. At the graveside, which saw thousands in attendance, a quartet of police officers from the Guinness local Maxwell Street station frisked everyone for weapons. On June 13, less than three weeks later, Mike Genna joined his brother in death. The occasion of his murder turned out to be a complicated double cross that was played out on the city's south side. The principals were four members of the Genna gang – Mike Genna, Samuts Amatuna, John Scalise, and Albert Anselmi – and the same three men believed to have killed Angelo on May 25 – Weiss, Moran, and Drusi. A few days earlier, the North Side gang members had approached Amatuna and promised him a payoff if he would deliver Scalise and Anselmi believed to have killed O'Banion, into their hands. They wanted them brought to the corner of Sangamon and Congress Streets at 9 a.m. on June 13th. Weiss, Moran, and Drusi would then drive past and gun them down. Abatuda pretended to accept the offer, then told Scalise and Anselmi about it. Angry, they told Mike Genna, who put together a double-cross. That morning, Moran and Drusi were waiting in their cars at the corner, confident that two of their sworn enemies would soon be dead. Suddenly, a large black car raced past them and shotguns were fired from the windows. Glass shattered and pellets pounded into Moran and Drusi's car. Both men were wounded but managed to return fire. They roared off in pursuit of the black car, but their own vehicle was too badly damaged to give much of a chase. They abandoned it on Congress Street and then collapsed on the sidewalk in pools of blood. Both men ended up in the hospital, where they recuperated for weeks. 
Meanwhile, the shooters in the other car were speeding south on Western Avenue. At 47th Street, they passed by a northbound detective squad car that was driven by Harold Olson. His commander, Michael Conway, was in the car, along with detectives William Sweeney and Charles Walsh. Recognizing Mike Genna at the wheel of the other car, Conway ordered Olson to turn around and go after the speeding sedan. The detectives were in a foul mood. Three of their fellow officers had been murdered by gangsters the previous week, and it's likely they were looking for a little payback. The Gennas hadn't been involved in the police officers' murders, but at that point, any gangsters would do. With its siren clanging, the squad car spun around and chased after Gennas' car, reaching speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. At 59th Street, a truck pulled out into the avenue, forcing Genna to slam on the brakes and swerve. He slammed into a telephone pole. Unhurt, the mobsters jumped out of the car with shotguns in hand. The squad car screeched to a halt a few feet away and the detectives scrambled out, their revolvers drawn. "'Why didn't you stop?' Conway demanded. "'Didn't you hear our gong?' The gangsters raised their weapons and fired. Conway went down with a load of buckshot in the chest. Walsh and Olson were also shot. Sweeney, the youngest officer, crouched behind the squad car and began firing over the hood. At that time, Southwestern Avenue was largely an industrial area, filled with factories. Soon, hundreds of workers began pouring out into the street. Factory whistles blew out a warning and riot calls began coming into the switchboard of the local police station. The gangsters fled, but Sweeney bravely followed, a revolver gripped in each hand. The gangsters ran across a vacant lot, and Scalise and Anselmi ducked into an alley. Genna ran on alone and then turned to face the advancing detective. He raised his shotgun and pulled the trigger, but both barrels were empty. He tossed the gun and ran toward a house beyond the empty lot. Sweeney fired. Genna was hit in the upper leg, but he kept going. He fell near the house, smashed a basement window, and dragged himself inside. When Sweeney and two other policemen found him, he was sitting on the basement floor, blood gushing from a severed artery. An ambulance was summoned, and he was rushed to Bridewell Hospital. As they were traveling, a guard leaned over to adjust the stretcher, and Genna kicked him in the face. "'Take that, you son of a blank!' he choked out. He bled to death in the ambulance before they made it to the hospital. Scalise and Anselmi managed to escape from the scene, but unbelievably decided to go into a dry goods store on 59th Street to replace the hats they had lost while running away. The police were still swarming all over the area, but the gangsters thought little of going into the store. The proprietor, though, Edward Isaacson, was immediately suspicious of the pair. He had heard the gunshots and sirens and knew that something had happened nearby. When the two bedraggled men came into the shop, their clothing torn and dirty, speaking in a foreign tongue, he refused to sell them anything. The two gangsters retreated from the shop, and seeing a streetcar coming to a stop at the corner, they ran for it. At the same time, another police car came roaring down Western Avenue. Isaacson hailed it and pointed at the two men, which he was now convinced had something to do with the guns and excitement. The streetcar was just starting to move when the police pulled Scalise and Anselmi off the rear platform. They were taken to the Central Detective Bureau and grilled by Chief of Detectives William Shoemaker, who questioned them through an interpreter. They were charged with first-degree murder for the slaying of the detectives. In a radio broadcast, State's Attorney Crow stated, "...these men will go straight to the gallows." He assigned Assistant State's Attorney McSwiggan, the young, hanging prosecutor, to the case. Capone shed no tears over the deaths of Angelo and Mike Genna. Although their role in the syndicate had been indispensable to Torrio's master plan, their greed, treachery, and bloodlust had made them problematic allies. In addition, they also blocked Capone's control of Little Italy and the booming alcohol cooking industry there. The Guinness had also made too much of their prestige from the presidency of the Union Siciliani, which Angelo gained after Mike Merlo's death. Since Capone was not a Sicilian, he could not even qualify for membership in the organization, but he did have plans to dominate it by installing his own officers in key positions. The Guinness had been in the way. Angelo had taken over the president's chair, but Capone wanted his consigliere, Tony Lombardo, in the top spot. For just this reason, he had no regrets over the destruction of the Klan. In fact, he contributed to it. According to an informer in Little Italy, 
Mike Genna was doomed that day, no matter how things turned out. The source told the police that Scalise and Anselmi had secretly defected to Capone and had accepted a contract from him to kill Genna. As Mike drove them down Western Avenue after the attempted hit on Moran and Drusi, he was actually being taken on a one-way ride by Scalise and Anselmi and by Al Capone. Tony Genna was the next to die. On July 8, a member of the Genna gang, Giuseppe Nerone, known as Il Cavaliere, telephoned Tony. Nerone had been unhappy with his position in the Genna organization for some time. He felt the brothers didn't appreciate his talents and was likely thinking that by killing off the rest of the Gennas, he could get a bigger piece of Little Italy for himself. Nerone told Genna that he had important information for him and wanted to meet him in front of Catilla's grocery store on Grand Avenue at 10.30 a.m. When Genna arrived, the two men greeted one another and then Tony was given a version of the Chicago handshake. As Nerone embraced Genna in greeting, an unknown associate stepped out of a doorway and fired five shots into Genna's back. Dying in the county hospital, Genna whispered to his mistress, Gladys Bagwell, a name that sounded like Cavallero. The police searched for a non-existent Italian by that name instead of Nerone the Cavalier, and by the time they realized their mistake, Nerone had been shot to death in a north side barbershop. Detectives believed that Nerone was coaxed into killing his boss and then taken out to get him out of the way. But who talked him into it? The cops were divided, some suspecting Vincent Drusi and others Al Capone. Tony was buried next to Angelo in Mount Carmel Cemetery. One of the mourners, noting the proximity of Dean O'Banion's grave, quipped, "'When Judgment Day comes and them three graves are opened, there'll be hell to pay in this cemetery.'" The surviving Gennas fled Chicago in panic. Jim went to his native Sicily and Sam and Pete went into hiding outside of the city. Jim was later arrested for theft and spent two years in prison. All three brothers eventually returned to Chicago but their power had been broken. They lived out the rest of their days in obscurity, importing cheese and olive oil. <laughs>